grateful for the invitation to speak here. Um, I have spent the last 12 and a half years at the Prince's School of Traditional Arts in London, first as a student and now as a member of a close-knit teaching and resource team. Um, I was first drawn to the school because it embraces an approach to the arts and crafts that resonated on a deep level. Uh, aside from teaching hands-on, practical, and technical skills, something which is increasingly rare in contemporary art education, um, it asks students to consider the modes of designing and making within a framework of universal principle. Tradition is understood as a living, breathing entity. Uh, principles which are handed on from one generation to another, not as rigid forms to be slavishly copied, but as points of inspiration which generate rich variety. The principles of geometry form the backbone of all of our work at the Prince's School. Now, I would like to teach you some geometry, um, but this is completely the wrong format. If I had my way, we would all be gathered around tables and you'd all have compasses and rulers and paper and we'd just draw together. That's the way to do geometry. Um, so instead, we're going to just, I'm going to show you some pictures and um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, sacred geometry is often approached as a big, mysteriously and kind of new agey topic that is expressed by complicated diagrams and accompanied by vague intimations that this golden ratio thing is super important. It is. <laughs> Today, however, I would like to approach the topic of geometry by looking at simple shapes, the very shapes that you first learn in kindergarten. Circles, triangles, and squares are the first shapes we learn as children. We quickly expand our repertoire to include rectangles, pentagons, and hexagons. Um, and then when we get really excited, we pick up fancy polysyllabic shapes like octagons and dodecagons. And then we ignore them for several years. Um, until we have to start writing formal proofs and bisecting angles and all that fun stuff. Um, and, you know, who does that in real life? Okay, well, maybe it's the wrong crowd, but... <laughs> so, the mathematics of geometry has developed through the millennia in response to problems in need of solving. And for a long part of human history, many, if not most, of these pro problems were architectural. Now, um, once most people graduate, aside from you guys here, they have very little motivation to, to discuss the properties of a parallelogram or construct a perpendicular line or bisect any given angle. And I would, I would guess that thanks to the development of computer drawing programs, we're also distanced from the hands-on qualities of working with geometry. We can draw complex shapes without ever really thinking about the fundamental properties of squares, circles, and triangles. And as a consequence, it's easy to forget the reasons that geometry was ever considered sacred in the first place. So now we're going back to kindergarten. Um, we're going to look at circles, triangles, and squares. And we're going to throw in some pentagons and hexagons for good measure. And most of what I'm going to be talking about will seem really basic. But these simple properties that I will be drawing your attention to are the keys to elegant design and beautiful proportion. The geometry of these shapes is the geometry of the sacred. Now all geometry has to begin with a mention of point, line, and plane. The spider is one of nature's geometers, and here we see the first letters in the alphabet of geometry. Point, line, and plane, here expressed as dewdrops on a web. The points of water are illuminated by the fire of the sun and cling to fine strands which radiate across the airiness of space. This is point, line, and plane expressed in their essence by nature. You can see the purity of the circle and the, um, in the uh, ripples and the sphere formed by the droplet of water. This is pure geometry expressed in nature. So our discussion of geometry and shape will begin with the circle. They are, of course, an instantly recognizable shape, um, as are their three-dimensional counterpart, the sphere. And Mother Nature is full of circles, and they're particularly abundant in her watery manifestations. Go for a walk in the early morning dew, and you'll see what I mean. 
Circles are formed either by a vibration echoing outward from a central point, as we've seen in this clip, or by a movement through time from one point on the circumference and back around to the begin again, beginning again, as we would draw it with a compass. Um, in this slide, we saw that a, that a circle is whole and complete and uh, exists all at once, echoing outward. This type of circle formation simply is. As drawn with the compasses, the circle is instead, it becomes. It is realized through a process of design. Um, as it's realized through a process of time. Now, as designers who use circles, the obvious must be stated. If we don't have the, the center of our circle correct and exactly in the right place, nothing on the circumference is correct. We must be centered as we, as we create. Um, circles are associated in every culture with the divine. They suggest un unity, eternity, inclusiveness, enclosure, the dome of the heavens. And as we will see, they are the matrix out of which pattern and order are born. That's kind of interesting words there, um, the words pattern and matrix. Their Latin roots harken back to the generative energy of mothers and fathers. Um, here we see this principle of expansion from a point of origin on a cosmic level. Again, we have that point at the center and the emanating perfect circles of creation. Um, this is just a visual hint that nature forms patterns and follows rules and uses these language, this language of geometry macrocosmically as well as microcosmically. Um, Galileo noticed this. Um, and he wrote, philosophy was written in this grand book, the universe, which stands continuously open to our gaze. It is written in the language of mathematics and its characters are triangle, circles, and other geometric figures. There are certain shapes that are useful to us because of their unique geometric properties. And these are our kindergarten shapes again. Um, and these shapes, um, are the basis of what is known in many circles as sacred geometry. <coughs> in this slide, we see many of these geometric shapes that Galileo might have been referring to. These are a few letters that appear in the book of the universe that he talked about. Now, the snowflake that we see on the left, or snowflakes, um, has a well-deserved reputation for uniqueness and variety um, as well as regularity. It is a, the perfect example of both unity and variety. At the molecular level, when water crystallizes into ice, it has fundamentally hexagonal qualities and it can't help but be obedient to the law of hexagonness. Um, yet within this law, individual snowflakes are radically different from one another. Tiny variations in climate produce this infinite variety. Uh, from this, we can learn and take the lesson that geometry and the rules of proportion are not a prison. They are a scaffold. The examples of flowers and fruits here that we see follow symmetries of five-fold, five, five -fold, four-fold, and three-fold symmetry. Um, incidentally, my teacher, Professor Keith Critchlow, has recently published a book which meditates on the geometry of flowers. In this, he explores the relationship between flowers and geometric proportion and considers the lily, so to speak. Underlying these floral, crystalline, and foliate forms, nature also plays with the purity of the circle or sphere. We live on a sphere. The sun and the moon, um, these are two spheres. We know scientifically that they are radically different in size, and yet we experience them as two identically sized disks in the sky. And they play a large role in symbolism and mythology of many cultures. Um, now, when you think of the human body, you don't normally think of geometry. Now, again, I'm talking to the wrong crowd here. <laughs> um, but we're lumpy, we're angular, we're anything but geometric. But our whole human experience is filtered through the pure circular geometry of the eye. Um, now, architecture, of course, has everything to do with geometry. Um, and I have gathered here a number of images 
that show architects identified by the attributes of the tools of geometry. Uh, and uh, as well as diagrams that show the human body as um, described by these tools. Um, geometry and creation are so intertwined in how, uh, how we have historically thought about, um, uh, about architecture that they even find manifestation in the idea of a master architect who circumscribes and delineates. Um, now, um, in the human body, as we, um, we saw a few presentations ago, we contain some of these basic shapes. Uh, we are square in that, um, theoretically, our, arms, our wingspan, our arm span, is the same as our height. Now, I've uh, measured uh, a bunch of kids, or had a kids in the classroom measure each other, and go home and measure their parents. And what we have determined is that some of us should probably be swimmers because our arms are too long, and some of us should probably be runners because our legs are too long. Uh, so the, this idealized form doesn't always seem to match up um, um, in the lab. Uh, but we also are circumscribed by a circle, uh, centered on the navel, the embryonic point of nourishment. So we have this circleness built into the body as well. Circle and square, heaven and earth, meet in the human body. And along the bottom row here, you can see some images of architects with their compasses, as well as a personification of, geomet of geometry, who's, um, who's there holding her compasses. Uh, these are some images from emblem books that show some of the meanings that have become associated with these architectural tools. Um, on the left, uh, or the upper row there, you have practice and theory. Practice holds her compasses so she can work on the face of the earth. She's material, she's practical. We can see that she has experience, maturity, and wisdom. Um, on, the other, on the other side, theory is identified by compasses that are opening towards the heavens. Um, they're on, on her head, and they're representative of ideas in the immaterial, the yet to be created. On the bottom row, we see beauty and judgment. Beauty is holding a bouquet of lilies, and her compass is open to the heavens. Um, next to her is judgment, and he's holding tools that enable him to draw straight lines and right angles. He needs to be sure that everything is just and true, um, other good architecture words that have um, extra layers of meaning for us. Hiding over there in the greenery, we have Prudence, who apparently draws very small circles. <laughs> The act of drawing circles is the beginning of all pattern and proportion. It is such a powerful idea that we see many medieval representations of God as the architect. Um, and this is just one, the most famous one. As we saw, the act of drawing circles with a compass involves a movement through time. This is in contrast to the water drop model, where the circle appears all at once and is whole from the beginning. From here, we're going to move forward and look at some of the basic shapes. We're going to begin by looking at how nature expresses some of these qualities. Now, we're, we're starting with the square um, because it, it, you know, we've just looked at the circle. Um, with the square, it's a natural complement to this circle and the symbolism of heaven meeting earth. Um, here we have several examples. There's a, a salt crystal, some flower forms, um, a little diatom in the, the lower center. Uh, this is the um, a pattern formed on the uh, tip of a platinum needle. Um, this is at a uh, uh, extremely um, tiny scale. And we also have the patterns formed by sand on a vibrating metal plate. Medieval architects could develop um, a design for a whole ca cathedral in which all proportional relationships were derived just with the square. Uh, these are some diagrams from um, a German book of um, architectural design that um, Albrecht Dürer referred to when he wrote his manual on measurement. The squares are the circle's symbolic partner. Um, now, it, when we think about the square, of course, it has four equal sides. It has four right angles. 
slightly less obvious, but still a fact, is that its diagonals are the same length and at right angles to one another. Uh, this repetition of right angles makes possible some interesting subdivisions of our original square. Um, and you can see here some, um, some designs in which those basic subdivisions have been applied. Um, these patterns are all related to one another in a family that could be loosely described as root two proportions. And we can see why here. A square's diagonal, if you have a, a side of, uh, of one, the, square, the diagonal has a length of a square root of two. Um, and, and if you want to write down a really long number, it begins 1.414.2135 and basically continues into infinity without repeating itself. Uh, it's much easier to just hold in your mind the relationship between the side of the square and its diagonal. Um, now, the, the root 2 rectangle has many interesting properties. Um, it is the only rectangle in, um, in the whole universe that you can cut in half and it makes two of itself. Uh, in, in Europe and basically pretty much everywhere in the world except here in the United States, they use this as a paper size which means that when you are expanding or reducing things on a photocopier, you don't have to trim off the weird extra edge. Um, so write letters to your congressman should switch to the A4 paper system. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, octagons fit within this root two family, um, and you can see that it, they're formed by two overlapping squares like this. And those little pink shaded shapes that you see there are root two rectangles, just some of them that are found within in the, the octagon. The octagon, um, as a shape, functions as a transition between a square and a circle. It is a bridging and connecting proportion. So from the square, we're going to go to hexagons and triangles, and we're going to talk about them together because they both fall within the root three proportional family. They're so interrelated because, of course, six equilateral triangles come together and make a hexagon. Now, hexagons are really closely related to the circle. Uh, we can kind of see hints of this in the um, close packing of circles in the honeycomb. Um, and apparently, I've been told this, that um, bees are trying to make circles, but they can't help but make hexagons. Now, I don't know how we know this, but, yeah. Now, it's a beautiful fact of, of um, our universe as it is that precisely six circles fit around a center seventh without any gaps, without any overlaps. Um, and this property is actually the thing that allows all of geometry, um, all of our geometry to um, exist. I don't know what geometry would look like if this were not a fact. So here are some examples of some expressions of the root three family of proportions as found within equilateral triangles and um, hexagons. Um, this uh, system of sort of diminishing triangles that we see on the top row is quite similar to that same system of diminishing squares that um, was seen on the previous slide. Um, and the geometry doesn't necessarily have to appear in straight lines. It can be this uh, skeleton or framework on which the, um, a design hangs. You see in this Isnik plate design over there on the right uh, that it regulates the positioning of motifs. Now here are a whole bunch of diagrams. I hope you find geometric diagrams as fascinating as I do because there's there's a lot of them right here. Uh, these are some different divisions of the hexagon. Um, and you can see that there are different ways of nesting stars and shapes within that either connect corners or midpoints within the main governing hexagon. Um, and just by um, building up um, a structure like this, you begin to have a whole proportional system in which any um, length of line that you choose off of that diagram is related proportionally to every other single um, line segment 
on that, that same diagram. Now, um, the, the, uh, the root 3 rectangle, um, we usually seen it drawn by taking the diagonal of a root 2 rectangle um, and swinging it up and giving, it the, giving us the height of the root 3 rectangle. That's the diagram in the lower right-hand corner there. Um, but it can also just be found within the hexagon itself. This proportion is within the shape, um, and that shape is found in nature. You can see what I was saying here about this, the six circles around the seventh with circles. Circles and sixes um, are really closely connected. So when we're going from squares and their symbolism into circles and hexagons, we can see that we have a little bit of earth and a little bit of heaven kind of coming together. So with um, the pentagon um, and its family, we have a whole family of five and tenfold patterns that can emerge. Um, and in nature, this is um, beautifully found in um, cherry blossoms and, um, and apple blossoms and so forth. Um, the, in that center column of images there, the top image is a tenfold design there. Um, that's actually a, a model of DNA um, as viewed down sort of the spine of the DNA. We're used to celebrating its double helix. Um, let's not overlook the fact that it is just really beautiful and uh, tenfold. Um, the diagram right below it is the path that the planet Venus draws around us. Um, every eight years, it draws this beautiful five-petaled flower. And this is going on all the time, this beautiful geometry, and it's completely invisible to us. Um, and below that is, of course, the apple. I still remember the time when I was in nursery school and my teacher cut an apple in half on the equator. And it was so shocking. First of all, my mom cut it in half in, on, in wedges and that was the right way to do it. And so this is wrong. But, <laughs> but I was stunned and amazed to see this beautiful 